Mitchell, wide receiver, Jeremy Curley of the New York Jets, and you're listening to the Shorts Sports Show. Welcome everybody to the Short Sports Show. I am your host Daniel Short. Today is Monday. I was about to say Friday. Wow. Monday, October 12, 2015. And we got a great show for you guys. We actually have a really great topic to talk about later in the show uh, with news of Jamal Charles now tearing his ACL and other players also having injuries. We got it, it, It's going to be a great show. Um, going to do a whole lot of recapping more in depth this time for college football and the NFL. I'm just very excited. It is now a sunny morning here at Short Studios in Santa Marcos, Texas. Um, allergies are still bad though. Allergies are still bad right now. <clears throat> Excuse me. But we're going to work through it like we always do and uh, get into this great fabulous show we have for you guys. I don't know if you're allowed to say fabulous uh, in the same context when talking about sports, but we went ahead and did it anyways, so we're going to do it again. Uh, We are in show 115. 115, ladies and gentlemen. I was just talking to someone a few days ago about the show, and it's crazy to think how fast two years have gone. Uh, we have done this show. We started, I believe, a week of or after my birthday, two years ago, which was August, uh, a little around the 24th. It, it, it's incredible to think how fast it has gone, how, t- how time has just zipped by. I mean, 115 shows, that, you know, it's a lot, but it just doesn't seem like a whole lot. It doesn't seem like we've done a lot of these, but I mean, this has been over two years. Two years and I believe three months or so, somewhere around that. Three years, two months. It, it, it's it's crazy. It's awesome, uh, and I have all of you guys to think to thank um, and to think about, of course. Uh, it, it's just been amazing how how we've grown. How we it, how it just started off with Spreaker, having about five to ten people listen. Majority of that was family, <laughs> and, and now we're at the range of two hundred. 500 listeners per show it's incredible it it really uh, it really is and i appreciate it and i thank you guys each and every day because without you uh this show would not be anywhere and i would be wasting my time (laughs) but you guys have been awesome Uh, i love doing this every monday and friday morning thankfully i have a good work schedule that allows me to do this show um but yeah, so thank you guys so much, so very much once again, and uh, yeah, so let's get on with the show. Uh, college football, I I don't know what I'm doing. I, I When I'm doing my picks, I, I don't know if it's Monday through whenever, but when I make my picks, I, I blank out, and I forget about everything I've said about this show, everything... Uh, all my knowledge of college football and the NFL just decides to slip from my head when I make my picks. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, I am now one in four against my daddy picks. It's and it's not like he doesn't know football. He well, he watches it. He listens to it as much uh, as, as close as close to as much as I do. But he's four and one. He's making better picks than I am. This week, I went all out for college football. I mean, I'll talk about it more on Friday's show. But we have seven different picks. We're actually week seven of college football this upcoming week. It's probably going to be the most intense college football we have ever seen. It's going to be crazy. Teams are actually playing better teams. It's no more cupcake games. I mean, you are straight in it. Most teams have already started, but now it's everybody. Everybody's playing someone tough this week. And it's going to be a great game uh games to watch but first after rumors and speculation maryland football head coach randy etzel was fra- was fired sunday after terrapin's third straight loss by at least three touchdowns athletic director kevin anderson said we appreciate the randy's tireless commitment to the university of maryland uh 
this was a difficult decision, but ultimately, this is the best course of action for our football program as uh, moving forward. Also, assistant head coach and outside linebackers uh, coach Lyndon Johnson was also fired Sunday. Uh, the move has been anticipated, of course, guys. We all knew about this uh, since reports came out last week that Etzel would be removed before the 2016 season. The crazy part about all of this, most college football fans do not like Ohio State right now as number one. Completely understandable because of the way they played. Now, we all saw, and we talked about this on the show on Friday, I said that Maryland should not have said anything about Randy Etzel and his coaching, uh, what, his coaching status, whether he would be uh, coaching next year or later this year. They should have said not one word. Because if you were watching the first three quarters of this football game of Maryland and Ohio State, you would have saw that Maryland was so, so very close. The score If you look at the score now, the game doesn't look like it was close at all. Really, in that, that fourth quarter, it, it became clear that you know Maryland was bad and Ohio State you know started pulling away. But this game was close. Imagine had Maryland just lost by less than a touchdown or had a touchdown, 10 points maybe, or had won this game. But they have already said, Randy Etzel would not be coaching 2016. Would that have changed their mind had Maryland won? Would have Maryland turned it all around? Would have after beating Ohio State, they turned it around and got a couple more wins, made bowl eligibility, and won a bowl game? Will Randy Etzel still be the head coach? You know how stupid this athletic department would have looked had Randy Etzel won this game and if they went on a run to make a bowl eligible? I mean, even if they just finished 6-6, six and six, I don't care. And won a bowl game, make it seven and six. You know how stupid Maryland would look, and they look stupid for the first three quarters. The athletic department, not the, not the football program, the athletic department. They got a little lucky with Maryland losing that game, <laughs> and I mean it just would have been terrible had for the athletic department had Maryland won this game. Um, you know, and we said on the show, do not say a word. Do not say a word. He should have never said nothing. Because you know how bad Ohio State's been playing against weaker competition. There was some, there was some hope for Maryland. There was. They didn't get it done. But uh, Maryland is now 2-4, and 0-2 oh in Big Ten. Has been outscored 122-34 to in its three-game losing streak, including an earlier defeat against Bowling Green. Maryland's four losses have come by an average of four touchdowns uh offensive coordinator mike loxley will serve as the interim head coach and loxley really isn't any better than randy etzel uh loxley has been with the terrapins since 2012 he also coached at maryland from 1997 to 2002 but when loxley was a head coach at the university of new mexico or new mexico university whichever he had a career coaching record of two and 26 you did not I'm not dyslexic right there you guys did not hear me wrong he won two games and lost 26 in three years he will make his debut against Penn State in Baltimore on October 24th uh, after a bye week this week I mean how re oh man it's you got you you think a coach that has a career record of 2-26 and 26 to take over your team is going to do better than Randy Etzel right now. You might as well just mark it off. Uh, I feel bad for Maryland fans. They The boosters have put a ton of money into this program. I believe I, I read something saying that they have invested over $155 million in, in, in just recent years of getting this athletic department to be one of the you know upgraded facilities and so on and so forth. That is crazy. Uh, it's, I feel bad for Maryland because I, I do like Maryland. Uh, the uniforms are kind of crazy here and there, but I do like them. I wish the best of luck for Maryland. Um, and, and whatever happens, Edsel leaves Maryland going after going two, 22 and 34 there. Maryland was 0 and 12 against ranked opponents under Edsel and only two of those 12 games, uh, were, were decided by 12 or excuse me, by single digits. 
USC center Max Turk will miss the remainder of the season with a torn ligament in his knee. The school announced Sunday. Uh, Turk started 38 games in his career for the Trojans and was first team selection on the ESPN.com preseason All-American team. The injury occurred uh, in the Trojans' 17-12 loss to Washington. How about them Huskies? On Thursday. Uh, so that USC, it just it gets bad. It gets worse from here. Uh, they also announced defensive end Claude Pellin is doubtful to play against the Irish due to a knee sprain. Receiver Stephen Mitchell Jr. is questionable with the ankle sprain. And cornerback Inman Marshall is expected to play despite an issue with his abdomen. But this... That wasn't the worst news. Here comes the worst news, and it should get better for USC, for Trojan fans out there listening. USC Trojans head coach Steve Sarkeesian is taking an indefinite leave of absence after sources say he arrived Sunday to a team's facility appearing intoxicated. Offensive coordinator Clay Helton will take over as interim coach of the team, the school said. Sarkeesian was not in attendance at the Trojans practice on Sunday afternoon, and USC Athletic Director Pat Hayden met with the media after practice to announce the move, saying it was, quote, clear to me he was not healthy. A player, y'all are about to hear the greatest quote of all time right here. A player told ESPN via text that Sarkeesian, quote, y'all ready for this? Showed up lit to meetings again today. He showed up lit. By far the greatest quote of all time, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, another source said that he showed up Sunday morning and appeared to be uh, not normal uh, and then was told to leave. Helton takes charge of the Trojans team that is 3-2 and two and 1-2 and two in the Pac-12 and has lost two of its past three games. Helton previously served as the Trojans interim head coach for the 2013 Las Vegas Bowl after previous interim head coach Ed Ordron quit. Uh, and apparently uh, Sarkeesian is going through a divorce. His behavior uh, has been just absolutely terrible. Uh, he's has influence with alcohol and painkillers at that salute to Troy function in August. Remember all of that? And said that he was drunk there and all this crazy stuff. And uh, a source told ESPN, quote, he's, he was dealing with family issues all Saturday night, but he hasn't been in a good place all season. Sarkeesian was also suspected by his staff to be under the influence during US, USC's 42-14 win over Arizona State on September 26, uh, though Pat Hayden was unaware at the time. And uh, it, it's just bad. It really is. And me, I've never really liked Steve Sarkeesian. And back when he was at Washington, uh, they were you know they sucked basically when he was there, and I just never liked. His coaching style, every time you see him on the sidelines and his interviews, I didn't like how he was. If I was a player, I would not ever want to play for Steve Sarkeesian. I just don't like him as a coach. He's just uh, not a coach, you know, a player's coach. He really isn't. Um, but, uh, you know, one of these problems that USC is dealing with now, of course, there's rumors going around that Chip Kelly, if he continued to struggle in Philadelphia, would he leave to come back to college? And, you know, since he's getting, being so criticized in college, would he come to USC, a big school, obviously back on the West Coast? Eagles are kind of winning right now. <laughs> they found something. Their offense is clicking. Um, I don't really know if he would leave Philadelphia uh, for back to college. I think it would be smart for him to go back to college. And it would be fun to watch USC with Chip Kelly there. That would be crazy. But I'm not trying to increase those rumors. Um, because it's most likely not going to happen. But with Steve Sarkeesian there right now, it's not getting any better. When you have a, a huge talent, it, this is basically the University of Miami of last year. You have all this talent there. I mean, look at who was drafted from Miami last year. Half the roster was drafted to the NFL, yet they only won six or seven games last year. It's probably going to be the same thing with USC. You're going to have a ton of guys drafted, uh, a ton of talent on that team. Yet, you're losing more games than you're winning. They've already lost a linebacker, Dalen Hayes, of Skyline High High School uh, in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, said he would reopen his commitment. Hayes apparently has been one of the most vocal recruiting commitments of USC's class of 2016. Uh, apparently, when he was at the Nike 
Oregon headquarters when they were doing that Nike elite stuff. Uh, he tried to convince other players in that camp to commit to USC. He's now decommitted. He's going to open it up. He has offers uh, from nearly 20 other top-tier programs, including UCLA, Ohio State, Alabama, LSU, Michigan, Notre Dame. I mean, he could really go anywhere. And this is huge for USC. And I wouldn't be surprised there's going to be more rolling in saying, okay, I don't want to play for USC until we find out if Sarkeesian is going to be the coach. And if he's not going to be the coach, who will be the coach uh, by the time they get there? USC, it doesn't get any better for them either. They have three straight games in this order. Number 14, Notre Dame. Number 4, Utah. And number 23, Cal. Back to back. To back for USC it's <laughs> it's not going to be good it really isn't um, and as, as a personal point oh Steve Sarkeesian finds um, something for him to be able to come back and not to coaching necessarily excuse me but more of back to normal Getting away from if he has an alcohol addiction, alcohol problem, getting away from that, finding the right help, finding the right resources around him, which he should be able to get uh, very quickly and clearly with uh, USC's you know expertise over there. But I think it'd be better for USC to move on from Steve Sarkeesian. Uh, he hasn't really produced like you would think he would. USC has been ever since Pete Carroll, they've picked terrible head coaches. I'm not saying, you know, you start rooting for Chip Kelly to come to USC. You can flirt with the idea, you know, not publicly, but it's time to move on from Steve Sarkeesian. He hasn't produced when he was at Washington. He hasn't produced at USC. You're losing recruits. That's the worst thing that's going to happen is that you start losing very, very talented players and very loyal players like Dylan Hayes was. Uh, trying to get other players to commit at that camp. Usually, you don't have to say anything, but he was. You don't want to lose players like that. You don't, and that's what's happening. Georgia running back Nick Chubb sadly suffered a significant injury to his left knee in Saturday's game against Tennessee, including damage to multiple ligaments and cartilage, but not the ACL. Uh, The school announced Sunday. Head coach Mark Rich said, quote, it's pretty safe to say Chubb will miss the rest of the season. Nick Chubb remains hospitalized for observation and is expected to undergo surgery within the next two weeks. And Bulldogs said a full recovery is expected. Rich declined to speculate on the schedule uh, for Chubb's return, saying, quote, All rehab is tough, but the best news is that there's no damage to a nerve or anything uh, vascular like an artery. The best news of all is uh, and of course the ACL not being damaged was a great as well. Uh, Nick Chubb was also uh, was injured on the first play of scrimmage on excuse me Saturday when he took a handoff to the left side of the field and landed awkwardly on his left leg as he was tackled out of bounds. Chubb entered Saturday having rushed for at least 100 yards in a school record 13 straight games. He was just dominating uh, at Georgia. He ranked second in the SEC this season with 745 rushing yards. Of course, uh, Leonard Fournette taking that top reign and has seven rushing touchdowns. He also averages 8.2 yards per carry. Thankfully for Georgia, you got a stable running backs behind him that can take the workload. No, they're not the same as Nick Chubb, but they still bring a dynamic element to the game and something to this offense to keep producing. You have sophomore Sonny Mitchell who replaced Chubb in total. Uh, 145 yards on 22 carries, adding three receptions for 26 yards. Keith Marshall was also given uh, touches as well, rushing for five times for 24 yards. So, you, you know, you're doing okay. Obviously, it's a huge, huge loss for Nick, uh, for Georgia and uh, sadly for Nick Chubb. Obviously, a Heisman hopeful, and that will not happen now with this injury. But was obviously doing great things and helping Georgia the best he, he could. Uh, with this team especially and it's just worse news because then you lost to Tennessee in a heartbreaking fashion after giving up a huge lead so Georgia fans keep hope alive best is yet to come 
But it really does suck for Nick Chubb because he was one of my favorite running backs as well. Uh, of course, every Sunday they release a new top 25, and uh, we don't have a new number one, though. Ohio State is still number one, even though uh, they basically escaped from Maryland, uh, coming alive in the, in the fourth quarter to get the W. So now we have, these are the top five. Number one, Ohio State. Number two, Baylor. Number three, TCU. Number four, Utah. And number five, Clemson. Now, uh, I should have said this in the beginning, but if, if you guys saw my tweet, before the top 25 came up by the AP poll, this is what I believe was going to be the top five. I thought Ohio State would stick at number one, even though I don't believe Ohio State is the number one team in the country. I still, we all know that until Ohio State loses, they will stay at number one, no matter what. Um, unless, you know, Utah just, Goes guns blazing. Oh, whoa. Sorry. Did not mean that for Greg Hardy, people. <laughs> See, anybody says Greg uh, says bl- uh, guns blazing. Okay? So relax, people. Um, you know, I don't know. I think Ohio State will stay at number one for a long time until they lose. Uh, but, yeah, I-, I thought it was going to be Ohio State, Utah, Baylor, TCU, and then Michigan State. That was my top five. I thought Baylor would stay at three. TCU would drop uh, um, to number four. And Utah would be number two. Nope. Not this, not this time. They had Ohio State again. Baylor, TCU, Utah, and Clemson at number five. Six through ten is LSU, Michigan State, Florida, Texas A&M stays at nine. And Alabama at number ten. Eleven through fifteen, you have Florida State, Michigan jumping up. To number 12, Ole Miss, Notre Dame, and Stanford. 16 through 20 is Oklahoma State, Iowa, UCLA, Oklahoma, Northwestern drops down. And then 21 through 25 is Boise State, Toledo, California. Even with the loss, they stay exact right at 23. Then Houston makes a jump into the top 25 at number 24. And Duke at number 25. Um... I, you know, I, I could, the last part of the uh, top 25 is not bad. I like that Houston finally got in. I think Memphis should have been in, uh, as well as uh, Temple. I think those should have been above uh, Duke. And, what well, I mean, Memphis is probably going to take a huge jump. If they beat Ole Miss, look for them being in the top uh, 20 for sure. I don't think it would, probably around like 18 or something, being undefeated, a high-powered offense. And beating an Ole Miss team, an SEC team, would be huge. Um, and thankfully, Memphis has that game at home, so hopefully that happens. So recapping this game, again, Ohio State gets the victory. They score 14 points in the fourth quarter to get the victory, 49-28. to Cardale Jones, he did really good, though. Uh, you know, it was the offense was just really slow in that first half, but he did fine. He was 21 of 28. 291 yards and two touchdowns. Uh, then TCU, how about the TCU-Kansas State game? Now, obviously, again, you guys know, as a TCU fan, I'm not going to lie, this game right here, I thought it was over in the first half. I usually don't quit on this team because I've seen what they've done all the way back from, you know, like uh, when we were played Boise State in a Mountain West Conference when they switched it that off season, they, it was supposed to be at TCU. They switched to the Boise State. Uh, that's when the Kellen Moore over there and all that good stuff. We had Casey Ball Hall. We went down, and my dad told me that was the first game I really, like, somewhat quit. I thought we were done. We lost, and my dad said, "Don't quit. Watch, and you never know." I was like, "Okay." Thankfully, I stayed. I watched. TCU got the uh, comeback victory on a rollout pass and for a two-point conversion to get the W from uh, Casey Paul Hall to Josh Boyce, corner of the end zone, touchdown, two-point conversion, excuse me, and TCU beat Boise State. Take it all the way back to this game. TCU was down 35-17 to at halftime. I seriously thought this game was over. The way Kansas State dominated us in the first half, the way they were taking advantage of everything our defense wasn't doing right, 
offense just wasn't on the field. The offense did everything right. I mean, a couple except for a couple of drives. Um, just we weren't on the field. <laughs> I mean, Kansas State took the took 22 minutes, almost 23 minutes off the clock in the first half. I mean, and, and TCU for a TCU offense, we're usually not going to have the most, uh, we're not going to have the ball that much. I mean, we score quickly. So that wasn't a big deal. But when you're able to just dictate the whole first half, the whole game, it's what it feel, felt like, it, and just dominate TCU like that, it was just, whoa. I mean, <laughs> it just, it hit me. And I think it hit TCU too, because Gary Patterson was talking about how, uh, a lot of players weren't taking this game serious. They weren't th- thinking that K-State was serious. They thought they were just going to roll over them. And look what happened. TCU comes back, gets the victory, 52-45 to over Kansas State. Trevon Boykin, 20 of 30, 301 yards, two touchdowns. He did have uh, two interceptions. One of them wasn't his fault, uh, but, you know, it was just a missed communication. Thankfully, TCA was a bounce back. Josh Doxson, the best receiver in college football, eight receptions, 155 yards, and two touchdowns. I believe that takes him over the 1,000 uh, marker, uh, if not very, very close. Trevon Boykin also led the team in rushing with 11 carries, 124 yards, and two touchdowns. He had a huge 66-yard run for a touchdown uh, to help get the game back and going in the second half. Uh, Baylor storm rolls over Kansas, sixty-six to seven. I, it was, ugh, they just dominated them. Seth Russell, eighteen of twenty-seven, two hundred forty-six yards and three touchdowns. Shock uh, Linwood, thirteen carries, one hundred thirty-five yards and a touchdown. And Corey Coleman, another great receiver, seven reception, seven receptions, one hundred eight yards and two touchdowns for Baylor. Michigan State, another close game for them. I don't know what is up with Big Ten teams, but they just love keeping it close against weaker competition. K State, uh, excuse me, uh, Michigan State gets the victory, thirty-one to twenty-four. Connor Cook, twenty-three of thirty-eight, three hundred fifty-seven yards and two touchdowns. Utah, I, I don't want to really say escapes because I mean they dominated California. Jared Goff throws five interceptions. But the offense just it, so shockingly, Cal stayed with Utah. I mean, they really did. They they shut them down with six points total in the second half. Granted, Cal only scored seven points in the second half complete total. But I mean, they did a good job settling down. And, and I'm really shocked by Cal's defense. I think that's why they stayed at 23, able to really hold this Utah team down in the second half and really you know do some things. They couldn't stop Devontae Booker, who had 34 carries, 222 yards, and two touchdowns. But if Cal's offense could have got up and going a little bit more in the second half, Cal could have got this game. So Utah, close victory. But again, all the whole point of winning is by winning at least by one point or more. That's all you got to do. Utah gets a victory, 30-24 to over Cal. Georgia Tech has just lost i remember we all remember two and zero, and they're not two and four 43 to uh four uh 43 to 24 excuse me then we got some news dolphins announced special teams coach darren rizzi has been promoted to assistant head coach uh, brand new news for the dolphins lsu defeats south carolina 45-24, LSU was the road team, even though it was in Baton Rouge, so we all remember. Uh, let's see, Arkansas kept it close. They had the lead 7-3 to at halftime, and then Arkansas did its thing by losing the game in the second half. Final score, 27-14, to Alabama beats Arkansas. Derrick Henry, 27 carries, 95 yards, and a touchdown. And, of course, Texas. I, I think Oklahoma is going to say from now on they never want to be favored by more than 10 points ever again against Texas. We all remember back in 2013, Oklahoma, huge favor to win this game, just like they were this year. And now it's done. <laughs> Texas comes back again to win this game. Well, they didn't come back. They just dominated the game, really. Final score, 24 24- 17 but they come they they beat the odds once again is what I meant they beat the odds again and beat Oklahoma and Oklahoma's championship hopes 
are basically gone because they're, they're going to lose either both or one of the games to either Baylor or TCU. Uh, so Oklahoma is done, and Texas plays its spoiler role and wins, and I'm happy for Charlie Strong for getting the victory. Florida defeats Missouri 21-3. to 6-0 Florida. Watch out. Florida State takes away any comeback Miami thought they had. 29-24. Broke my heart. I saw that Miami took the lead. I was so excited. I was like, okay. Because they couldn't stop Dalvin Cook. Dalvin Cook, 22 carries, 222 yards, and two touchdowns. Might as well call him deuces. Switch his number to two because he he did everything for this offense. Um, And I was like, okay, Miami, you got a shot. You can do this. If we have the lead, all you got to do is hold them. Doesn't happen. Florida State gets the victory. <laughs> the U. What happened? I still have not got my acceptance letter from Miami. Uh, I, as you guys know, I've applied to Miami. Still, still, still waiting. Still waiting. They keep sending me brochures and telling me to go visit Miami. It's like, uh, I don't really have money for a plane ticket. So unless you guys are going to pay for it, I can't really go. So uh, Miami, help me out. <laughs> Northwestern. Gets shut out again. Michigan gets another shutout. Three straight shutouts for Michigan. Final score, 38 to nothing. It was 21 to nothing after the first quarter. Michigan, well, it's it's weird. They put up a ton of points right now. It's just they don't really have an offense. It's, it's a very boring offense to watch when they can't run the ball. Uh, Devion Smith. Eight carries, 59 yards. Jake Rudock, 17 of 23, 129 yards. But Northwestern, I believe, should have been out of the top 25. They always do this. They always go 4-0 or 5-0, and and then when they play real competition, boom, they just get knocked out. They get punched straight in the face and can't respond. This is one of those games again. So Michigan, excuse me, Northwestern, to me, shouldn't even be in the top 25 because I feel like they're going to collapse again, go like 7-6 and six or something like that. Um, maybe eight and four at the best at the end of the year with a bowl victory, uh, if they can get a victory in the bowl. But Michigan is for real, man. Ole Miss dominates New Mexico State fifty-two to three. Navy almost had it with Notre Dame. Notre Dame always keeps it close in the first half, and then they just start scoring in the second. Final score forty-one twenty-four. Notre Dame beats Navy. Uh, Tennessee comes back thirty-eight to thirty-one. They were down 21 points, and Tennessee comes back and gets the victory. <sighs> it's crazy. Oklahoma State defeats West Virginia 33-26 in overtime. I was hoping for West Virginia to win this game so much. I still don't believe in Oklahoma State. They're 6-0, and but they're not a great 6-0. and I think Georgia could beat them. I think uh, Notre Dame, Navy would probably give them a good game. Ole Miss could beat them. Northwestern most likely could beat them. Michigan obviously would beat them. Florida State. All these other teams could easily beat Oklahoma State. West Virginia, I had hope for you to get this victory. And Oklahoma State stays alive. Let's look at their schedule before they play TCU. I want to see what that is. Uh, Iowa defeats Illinois 29-20. to uh, Toledo beats Kent State 38-7. to And then Boise State defeats Colorado State. Uh, 41 to 10. So good scores there. Try to switch over to NFL. Talk some NFL news. All right, let's see. All right, so Oklahoma State has Kansas, so they'll obviously beat them. And then they go at Texas Tech on Halloween. So hopefully that becomes a night game. And then they play TCU uh, after that. Hopefully Tech can exploit them a little bit. If they can do that, we should be all right and everything should run smoothly. Uh, what else we got? So let's see. Let's move over to the NFL. And here, right after we talk about Jamal Charles, we're going to talk about a subject that I want to hear from you guys and what you guys think about this. So, as we all know, Kansas City Chiefs running back Jamal Charles now has a torn ACL. Uh, he was he is scheduled for an MRI today, so you know probably in a couple of hours he should have it. Uh, Charles put no weight on his leg after he was helped off the field. He was briefly examined by medical personnel on the sideline before heading to the locker room. Uh, Jamal Charles missed all but two games in 2011 when he tore his ACL in his left knee. So now that leads to the discussion of this. With Nick Chubb of Georgia, 
And Jamal Charles of Kansas City. Well, Nick Chubb didn't tear his ACL. But, um, and along with other players, you know, Virginia Tech, Kendall Fuller, uh, and many, many other players in college football and the NFL tearing a ligament in their knee or having some injury that sidelines side them for an entire year. Is it that players are more prone to injuries now with less stability in these newer cleats? And, and it brings up the question. That if you go pick up a, a football cleat, that's not an offensive lineman's cleat, uh, or a lineman's cleat, I should say. If you go pick up a cleat, any of cleats, Nike, Adidas, Under Armour, uh, whatever else is out there, whatever company makes football cleats, if you go pick them up, how heavy are they? They're not. They're light. That's the whole point. They're, they're, they're trying to have it where there's basically you're, you you have socks on. It's basically what it's trying to come down to is they're so light, you have no weight on your feet, so you're able to run faster, be more quick, which is great for, you know, being quick, obviously. But the thing is, someone brought it up, and I can't remember. Uh, it was a podcast I was listening to, and someone th- brought it up. They didn't really discuss it. They just brought it up, and then... It's like it bypassed everybody, but it hit me, and I was like, whoa, you know, that's 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 a good, uh, not a good idea, but it, it just, it's real. It's a good thought. What if, what if it's the cleats? These cleats are so much focused on trying to be quicker, trying to be the lightest cleat out there, that maybe because of today's technology and players just being bigger, they the cleats aren't really right for their feet and uh you know trying to think of how to do this all and that that's the whole thing what if these cleats are the reason that more players are getting hurt they're not right for the the right they're not right they're just not good for the player stability um so that's my thing I want to hear what you guys have to say on Twitter at short underscore sports 24 seven on Twitter or on Facebook, the short sports show. Let me know what you guys think. Do you think it's cleats that are part of the reason players are more prone to injury, leg injury and uh, mainly, you know, leg injuries because of the less stability that these cleats have. They're all about speed, but they're not about holding these players upright and, having them be able to place their foot, plant their foot effectively because it's more about picking up the feet and going. That's my thing. I want to hear what you guys have to say. Uh, Detroit Lions, the quarterback Matthew Stafford was told at halftime if he threw one more interception, he would be benched. Well, guess what? Stafford did on the first drive of the second half, and he was replaced by backup Dan Orflosky, part of a 42-17 victory for the Arizona Cardinals over the winless Lions. However, Lions head coach Jim Caldwell said Stafford will remain the team's starting quarterback. Uh, Stafford completed 20 of 32 passes for 188 yards and a touchdown with three interceptions before being replaced. Orlowski playing his first game with the Lions since the Lions went winless in 2008, completed 21 of 38, 191 yards, a touchdown, and an interception. Codwell said the Lions, quote, weren't getting anything done consistently on offense. So he was trying to change the direction uh, at that point, even though the Lions were tra- trailing 35-7 to by the time Orzlowski entered the game. The Lions are now 31 in the NFL at 292 yards per game of total offense and continue to have the league's worst run offense. Codwell said despite Detroit's continued offensive struggles, there will not be any coaching change this week. And honestly, it might not be up to him. He might be the one gone midseason. Uh, you know, Jim Codwell, everybody wants to give him props and say he's a great coach. And no disrespect, what has he accomplished? The one successful year he had in Indianapolis when he was head coach was because of Peyton Manning. Y'all remember when Peyton Manning got hurt and was out? Oh, that's right. What, they went 1-15, 2-14 or something like that? That's how they were able to get Andrew Luck? He's not a good coach. 
I don't know why people say he deserves interviews and he deserves a head coaching job. He's a good coordinator at something because it's definitely not offense because they don't have anything right now in line with the Lions. And you should with the wide receiver core you have, pretty solid. You got good running backs. Doig Bell, power back. Amir Abdul. Abdul is a scat back. I mean, you should be able to pick up something. You know, I know the offensive line isn't the greatest, but really your defense is what should be struggling, not your offense. I, I'm not a fan of Jim Caldwell. Everybody wants to give him major props for his coaching, and he really hasn't done anything in the NFL. Um, so I think it's more of Jim Caldwell needs to be fired, and they need to find another head coach in, for Detroit and get something going because – and also, I, I believe that Matthew Stafford should, uh, you know, step up as more of a leader to this offense. You know, he needs to be the one. If he doesn't feel like the play call is right, which he should know by what's happening with their, with their struggles and previously, you know, being successful before. He's been to the playoffs before. He knows what it takes to have a high-powered offense. He needs to take more of a leadership charge and, and get this offense going, even if he feels like the play calling isn't right. Change it up at the line. Codwell, again, had Peyton Manning for a year. So he knows what it's like. But he also knows what it's like to run a team into the ground. The Lions shouldn't be 0-5 right now. It, that's They are not the same team as they were back in 2008 when they went 0-16. This isn't the team. Their chances of making any playoffs right now are drowning by the second, by the day, by the week. And I think it's more of the head coaching. We'll just have to see. Multiple teams, including the Dolphins, are expected to inquire about Saints head coach Sean Payton's avail- uh, availability after the season per sources. The Colts have also been mentioned as a possible suitor for Payton, according to league sources. Uh, Payton has two years remaining on his contract after this season, but will not deter teams from approaching uh, Saints about a potential deal. And I saw something. I just got a notification on my phone about this. Um, Oh, yeah. Sean Payton, quote, intrigued by Colts and Dolphins report interest, concerned about New Orleans ownership issues. We'll just have to see. That was just coming up. Um. Of course, Payton's name has uh whoops, I just whoops, here we go. Payton's name has come up in speculation about other jobs over the past year because of, uh he has been in New Orleans for 10 years and the Saints appear to be in rebuilding mode after overhauling basically the entire roster last season. Uh excuse me, this offseason really. And also Payton has ties to current Dolphins interim head coach Dan Campbell, who was promoted Monday after Miami fired Joe Philbin. Campbell played tight end for the Cowboys when Payton was a Dallas offensive coordinator and ended his playing career under Payton in New Orleans. The Saints went 7-9 last year, marking the first losing season with uh, Sean Payton as head coach since 2007 and are now 1-4 after getting demolished by the Philadelphia Eagles. Which leads us to our recap of NFL games this past week. Also tonight... The Pittsburgh Steelers go on the road to take on the San Diego Superchargers. Monday night, tonight, 7.30 Central Time on ESPN. Phillip Rivers, please, please do something for me. Melvin Gordon, please do something. That would be nice. Uh, okay, I no, we talked about the Colts and how the, how the Texans just screwed up there. Don't need to talk about that again. How about the Cincinnati Bengals? 5-0, and Andy Dalton, 30-44, 331 yards, and two touchdowns. Thomas Rawls for the Saint, uh, excuse me, Seattle Seahawks, 23 carries, 169 yards, and a touchdown. I bet uh, many, many people picked him up on the fantasy, and if you haven't, I'm sure you're about to. Uh, the Seahawks had, a, of course, a 24-7 lead and watched it just disappear as the Bengals stormed back to win in overtime, 27-24. You see the field goal kick? It hit the left crossbar to bounce back in to make it good for the Bengals as they improve to 5-0 and as the Seahawks drop to 2-3. and 
The Patriots get the victory over the Dallas Cowboys, 30-6, to and dominated the entire game. Tom Brady, 20 of 27, 275 yards and two touchdowns. Julian Edelman, four receptions, 120 yards and a touchdown. Um, I was watching this game with my family, and of course they're all Cowboys fans. And, man, I, I the Cowboys offense is the well I, can, well, I mean, the Bears and the Chiefs, the Redskins, they're pretty bad to watch too, but the Cowboys have one of the most, they're so boring to watch. They're so boring to watch without Tony Romo. Uh, Brand, and it's, I guess it's mainly on Brandon Whedon. He's just a boring quarterback because this, this game was just bad. <laughs> I was, I, I've never been bored watching football because I've just been, you know, it's football. You know, if you're a football fan, you don't get bored watching a game. You're not a true football fan if you get bored. But it's boring to watch the Cowboys. It is super boring to watch the Cowboys. They are terrible on the offensive side of the ball right now. Uh, the Bears come back to beat the Kansas City Chiefs 18-17. to Ugly, weird score for terrible teams. Uh, the Washington team lost to the, uh, the Atlanta Falcons. In a way, you'd think Washington would lose. In overtime, with a pick six. Yep. Matt Ryan, not so good. 24 of 42, 254 yards and two interceptions, no touchdowns. Devontae Freeman did his thing again. 27 carries, 153 yards and a touchdown. Uh, the Buccaneers defeat the Jacksonville Jaguars 38-31 in the Florida's most boring game to watch. <laughs> no one really cared about. Philadelphia Eagles beat the New Orleans Saints 39-17. They did it. DeMarco Murray, 20 carries, 83 yards, and a touchdown. Um, Drew Brees, 26 of 43, 335 yards, and two touchdowns. The Browns go to overtime with the Baltimore Ravens, and they beat them. The first time the Browns have gone on the road to play in Baltimore and get a victory since 2007. The Browns get it 33-30. The Packers defeat the St. Louis Rams 24-10. Aaron Rodgers, eh, did okay. Just 19 of 30, 241 yards, two touchdowns. Did have two interceptions. He uh, had never thrown in a, an interception since like forever in Lambeau Field. And then he did. Todd Gurley doing his thing the most he can for the St. Louis Rams. 30 carries, 159 yards. Uh, the Bills and Tennessee Titans, they played. I don't know if that many people watched. <laughs> in a boring game as well, 14 to 13. Marcus Mariota, 21 of 32, 187 yards and an interception. He did okay, um, but obviously would love to got the victory and the touchdown. Cardinals defeat the Lions. We talked about that, 42 to 17. It was 28 to 7 at halftime. Man, oh man, poor Lions. Uh, Broncos stay undefeated against the Oakland Raiders, 16 to 10. Payne Manning for the first time in his career since his rookie year. Has more interceptions than touchdowns with seven interceptions and six passing touchdowns. He was 22 of 35, 266 yards, and two picks, no touchdowns. And in last night's game was an exciting game, and who really thought the 49ers would stay close with the Giants? Eli Manning threw 54 passes, guys. He was 41 of 54, 441 yards, and three touchdowns with the pick. Odell Beckham. Seven receptions, 121 yards, and a touchdown. Final score, the New York Giants win 30-27 to with the last second touchdown. Awesome drive for the Giants. And thank you, Eli Manning, because I had you on my fantasy team. Did not disappoint. Appreciate that, my friend. And I believe, let me check, that is it for today's show. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, be sure to hit that like button if you're brand new to the channel. Hit that subscribe button as well or follow, whatever it may be. Whether you're listening on iHeartRadio, Spreaker.com, YouTube, I, iTunes, everything, Stitcher Radio, we, we're on everywhere. Be sure to like it and share it with your friends uh, and your family. Thank you guys so much. Follow me on Twitter at short underscore sports 24-7. And as always, God first, God bless, and I'm out. Peace. I'll see you guys Friday.